Boys and girls, it's so great to have you back with us for our very last Fun Friday special guest. And boy, do we have a special treat for you today. I want to introduce you to Miss Deborah Novak. We're going to call her Miss Deb. She works at the New Mexico Museum of Natural History, and she has brought a ton of stuff for us to look at and talk about today. And we have a video coming up behind the scenes at the Natural History Museum here in Albuquerque. And boys and girls, if you haven't been to this museum yet, when things start opening back up, I hope that you and your family will go to the Museum of Natural History, which is downtown near our Old Town section of the city. And we are so excited that before too long, you're going to be able to see what's going on at the museum. So, Miss mm -hmm. Deb, thanks for coming today. You're very welcome. I'm excited to be here and share stuff. Since we haven't had visitors at the museum, I haven't gotten to share all yeah. the cool, fun stuff. And there's so, so much wonderful stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, the Museum of Natural History and Albuquerque Public Schools has a relationship. We actually share a partnership mm -hmm. at the Sandia Mountain Natural History Museum, which is up in the Sandia Mountains. And on our YouTube channel, APS Expect Great Things, there is mm -hmm. a playlist of videos yep. that our friends at the museum have put together with our teacher, our resource teachers from APS. And so you can watch those too. And I think you're gonna hear some of those same kinds of things here with what you brought. So tell us what we're gonna be looking at today. Well, I think I'm gonna segue with your Sandia Mountain comment because they're up at the top backside of the Sandia Mountains. So if you look at our mountain range off to the east, if you're in Albuquerque, we've got behind it, the mountain goes kind of this way. And that's where the Sandia Mountain Center is. And if you go up there, it's a fabulous place to find fossils. And what I was asked to talk about today was dinosaurs, everybody's favorite topic, yep. and fossils. And so what I've got over here, I'm gonna to move to the document camera. I started out actually with a map of New Mexico because this, all these different colors. Let's move that toward you a little bit so we can see the top of the state. There we go, there got we it go. all it now. Was right at the top, yeah. yeah. All these different colors show the kinds of rocks that we have at the surface of New Mexico. So if you walk outside, you know that there's trees or grass or whatever, but if you dig down, these colors indicate the type of rocks that, that are there. And that's why we find so many dinosaurs and so many fossils in New Mexico, is if you go outside in New Mexico, you can often find rock right. <laughs> easily. We can see our rocks. They're not covered with forest. And luckily, our entire state's not covered by big cities. So our paleontologists go to where what they want to find is, but for us, the top of the Sandia Mountains. And that's right about in yeah, here, is that correct? Right about in there. Right there, okay. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Sandia Mountains, it looks kind of like a layer cake at the very top, and there's a white layer. And that's where we find a whole lot of really cool things. Oh, see look here. at this. Ooh. Oh my goodness, that's beautiful. Yeah, so this particular fossil was found in the Manzano Mountains. And you can see that it's sort of kind of flaked out of the rock. If you hit the rock, when you find a rock like this, if there's a fossil in it, it'll actually break yeah. where the fossil is. And we even have, we're really lucky, the other side of this, it's like a puzzle piece. So this was the part, this was on top of it. So this was on top it of it, and we didn't see this shape at all. What you would see is just rock. A flat rock. A flat rock. And our scientists know to our paleontologists who go out in the field and look for fossils, paleontologist, mm -hmm. they know with this kind of rock where this is found in the Manzanos that if they just keep sledgehammering and picking up the bigger pieces and breaking them into smaller pieces, there are places where the rock will break naturally and show us the fossils. So now, which part is the foss is the actual item there, and what's like the imprint left behind? Because I know there's a difference mm -hmm. in that, right? Well, in this particular fossil, fossil means organic material or once living material that's left behind. So in this particular one, both sides are actually a fossil. Okay, so they both have it. There. They both have it because the plant got smushed. Okay. And then lots of pressure. So there's no longer any plant in there. There's nothing like green or leafy, right. but we have the remains of the plant on both sides of this particular one. But what I think you're talking about may be the idea of casts and molds. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so over here, 
I think this is big enough to see. This is a cast T-Rex tooth. A tooth. This yep, is a tooth. This is a tooth, a <laughs> single tooth. And it's not even the biggest tooth. That's the funny And how part. many teeth would this animal have, do you think? Well, it depends on which kind of tyrannosaurid we're talking oh, okay. about. All right. And I don't know that number off the top of my head. But it head, would be a lot. But it would be a lot. So this I want to say one. in the 80s. Oh my gosh, can you imagine 70s, 80 of 80s? these in a mouth? That's yeah. amazing. So this has actually been created out mm -hmm. of like plaster. So we would take the fossil tooth, and I don't have the tooth here because it's actually in our scientific collection. Okay. What I was able to bring here is from our teaching collection. So the and T Rex teeth you don't find them very often. Okay. So those wind up locked behind They're doors. Rare. You're going to see it in a video later on. So what we would do is take the T Rex tooth, and they would pour a substance over it that and would model. then make and it would make the shape. Okay, so like I might have the tooth shape in mm -hmm. there, and that would. That and this is another one. Yeah. Okay. This, yeah, and this one's actually from the Sandia Mountains. We'll go back to that in a minute. Okay. okay. And then they would pour a substance in. And sometimes they use different kinds of substance because this is another one. And then they, we often paint them to look like the real the fossil. Real thing. So this is this is a, this is a model of it. This is not the yeah. real tooth, but it looks so real. Mm -hmm. So it would look like the real thing. And so is this one. Now this one, we were ooing and eyeing over this guy a little mm -hmm. bit later. What kind of um, dinosaur would this have been? This is actually our state dinosaur. Coelophysis. Coelophysis. And Coelophysis, I have a little one down here. Okay. It was a little early dinosaur. They were probably about as tall as we are. Okay. Except that they have that really long neck. Okay. With this little tiny head. This is an adult. And then a really long tail to balance at the other end. So this is the eye socket That's here. That's the eye socket there. And you can see the teeth. Oh mm -hmm. my goodness. Even though they're small, those are vicious looking teeth. And we think that they hunted in packs because the most famous Coelophysis fossil find is in Ghost Ranch, which is up north around Abiquiu. Mm -hmm. And they found hundreds of them buried in one place. And you'll get to see a block from that, that place that has about a dozen in the video. So you'll get to see what got pulled out of that quarry. Now, Coelophysis, can we tell what kind of things it ate by the kind of teeth that it had? Well, this one, Sort of. We sort know of. it. We know it didn't eat vegetation. Okay. The the common hypothesis, the guess we have from the teeth shape, some of them are slightly back, which often has to do with eating fish or slippery things. But we also know um, that they ate insects. They probably ate other small dinosaurs and lizards and other things that so were they running were around with them. Carnivores, basically. They were indeed carnivores. Okay. As opposed to herbivores, which were the ones that ate mm -hmm. the vegetation. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And you'll hear more about those in okay. the film, too. He's, he's so, wonderful. Yeah, so we have a state dinosaur. So then we've talked about casts. Okay. People often ask us, is this real? Well, yes and no. It is a real scientific model of a real fossil. So, because on here, you can even see where the gum line was. Yeah. <laughs> you can see there's something called serrated edge on this. And if you feel carefully right along there. Yeah, it's got kind of a like a jagged kind of feel like like on this i was wondering why you had a knife with you today i was gonna say i was worried about bringing a knife no i'm glad one you brought it usually carry a knife but it is a bread knife yeah and it has a serrated edge it has those little scallop shaped and that that's the, what this is that's right what here. the edge is there for it's, cutting through the meat okay yeah. it's just a lot smaller mm -hmm. than the the serrated edge here yeah. i'm not even sure if we put it under there we'd be able to see the serrations but you can feel them you can feel it yes you it's can feel pretty it pretty amazing that is pretty cool i did not realize that the tooth mm -hmm. itself had a serrated edge i was thinking just this sharp pointy mm -hmm. tooth but it's part of the tooth itself that has that ability to tear things apart and chew it. Yeah. That's so amazing. I wouldn't want to have met one of those. I would not want to have either. So but I'm very that's glad really we big. That. We're going to go back small to the Sandia Mountains because I want to point out some of the other things that are okay. in my case here. I'm okay. Scoot it a little bit this whoop, wrong direction. There we go. This way. Okay. Because at the top of the Sandia Mountains, you can find plants. Mm -hmm. But what you're most likely to find are things that lived in the ocean. Take a look at that a little closer and then I'll put it back down. Okay, now why in the world on, this, on the east side of the mountain would you find things that would be in the ocean? Think about that. Mm -hmm. And way up high too. Yeah. Way up high. Well, 
So that looks kind of like a shell of some sort. That is indeed a seashell. It's called a brachiopod. And then we have a horn coral here. I'm trying to turn it and get my big fingers out of the way there so you, you can see. We, we can know see it's it. a coral because you can see that pattern. Yeah. And it's called a horn coral because it's horn shaped. Yeah. And then we also find on this one, it's really tiny. Even in here, there's a little teeny tiny trilobite. And I'll hold up a bigger one because that's one of the fossils that a lot of people know a lot about. Trilobites. They yeah. lived along the ocean floor. We saw, we have a, a trilobite fossil that I brought in um, when we did our fossil and rock segment in the spring. So, mm -hmm. okay, we're about, we've got about 10 minutes, yeah. so we want to keep moving forward yep. here. So I'm going to show you this one because this is the one that people bring in the most. And it's from a critter called a crinoid. Okay. And they look okay. like little round, little I think you tubes. can see on there, little tubes, and they often break along the segments and they look like beads. And people think that perhaps they're beads, but they're not. But they're they the were stalk not. of a crinoid. I'm gonna move this aside. Okay. And I'm gonna move that aside. Oh, hey, I had some dinosaurs and not dinosaurs on there. But if you go to our website, you can actually find information about how to tell what some of the common fossils are. So okay. these so are showing they could you... see some things that look like this in the Sandia Mountains on the east side of the mountain. Yep. And then this particular paper also shows you what it looked like when it was alive. So this was the crinoid this itself. This is a living crinoid, and it lived on the bottom of the ocean. And what we find are all these okay. little disks. Okay. And then we had... The seashells. The now, bacupons. would you find lots of crinoids in one place or would they be kind of solitary or might there be a cluster of them? Well, what you usually find is a mix of these because okay. it was all a shallow ocean across there. And when it got, when they all got buried mm -hmm. and then there's layers and layers of them, you'll find a mix. What you often see is more like a big boulder that has one of these sticking out of it that okay. you can't take because it's stuck in the boulder. Neat. But if you find areas where erosion has happened, mm -hmm. where stuff is crumbling out of the rock. They might be all jumbled together. They, they might be jumbled together, but I sometimes sit up at the top of the Sandia Mountains and just pick up rocks and look at them mm -hmm. until you see patterns. Okay. And that's one way to find fossils. Okay. Now, if you're in the Sandia Mountains mm -hmm. and you are looking for rocks and fossils, is it okay to take them out of there? What's it, the rules about that? <laughs> well, there's a lot of rules, and each state has its own rule, and each type of land has its own rule. Okay. If you're on someone's private property, it's their private property. So if it's not your property, you need to ask them if you can search for fossils and keep them. It's and if the answer is no, the answer is no. The answer is no. Okay. On some of our public lands, fossil collecting is allowed as long as it's an invertebrate. It's something that doesn't have a backbone. So okay. seashells, this would be it's okay. a coral, all of this would be okay. But if you found something like Ceylophysis, <laughs> you could not take it out. You could not take okay. it out. And what we prefer you do is actually take a picture of it. Don't even try to dig it out yourself because mm -hmm. you can damage the stuff around it or the fossil itself. Mm -hmm. And then call our museum okay. and, and bring us out to where it is. Now, I know you all have a really good website that has a lot of information about yeah. what's okay and what's not okay. Mm -hmm. So we could put that on our resource pages. So if you're interested in doing some fossil hunting, we could make sure that you are doing it in, mm -hmm. a, in a safe and an okay place by looking at their website. Okay. So, and bone is another thing that is not allowed. And I brought this. This is actually polished so that you can see that it's bone all these little patterns in there let us know that this is a piece of bone. And this is a piece of dinosaur bone that I bought in Utah. Mm -hmm. And the reason I could buy it is because, again, sometimes things get all jumbled up and you can't tell what's what. Those are the kinds of things that, that are sometimes for sale mm -hmm. in, in rock and mineral shops. Okay. But if they find a whole big skeleton. We never find the whole thing, but if we find most of a skeleton, that's the kind of thing that you want to go to a museum, a museum ideally. for. And, and we have where it is. Okay. And if you happen to dig up one of those illegally, mm -hmm. it gets taken away from you. Right. So we yeah. want to make sure that we're doing the legal, the correct thing. So okay. if you do want to go fossil hunting, check what the area you're looking at Okay. allows. Okay, great. Now you brought, you brought some other things that you said were from the Sandias, and I'm really curious about these because when I was looking at them, I was like, they look like rocks to me. Those actually go with the dinosaurs. Should we bring them over here to the so document camera? We can bring them over here to the document camera. Okay. You brought, you have another thing over here that's so really cool. That I brought one of my favorite fossils, and this actually comes from dinosaurs. This oh, one too. There, yeah, we've got an egg. So these, Miss Jamie, 
If you pick them up and do this, what happens? Okay, so imagine they look somewhat polished. So they've rubbed up against each other. They've gotten very smooth. Mm -hmm. They are, um, they look kind of glassy a little bit, just like your typical rocks that you'd find in the yard. In the yard or possibly in a river. Okay, yeah, where the water and the sand has gone over it mm -hmm. and made it real smooth and polished, okay. Well, where those were found is under dinosaur rib cages. And scientists were confused for a long time why river rocks were sitting under dinosaur rib cages. But what they finally figured out is right under our rib cage is our stomach. And so this is this word here, gastrolith. So these are part of the organs of the dinosaur. Or it, they were it gets in, even better than that. It gets better than that, okay. Gastro means stomach, lith means rocks. And if you have chickens today, if you keep chickens or other birds, they often pick up pebbles and swallow them. It helps them digest their food. Well, dinosaurs did the same thing. Oh, my goodness. And so these were in the stomach of a living dinosaur, and that's where they got all this pretty polish from. Because it was helping the dinosaur digest. digest its food. Yep. That is fascinating. And these were found in the Sandias. These were not found in the Sandias. They were not. Okay. I was wrong about yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. We found some cool sharks up there, though. Yeah. That is something you might want to investigate on your own. Um, dinosaurs, most of the dinosaurs we find here are in the Bistai Badlands mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. We found our Seismosaurus up near Cuba. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to find the right age rocks. Yeah. Now, the Seismosaurus is a long-necked dinosaur. It is. And I know you brought something we were looking at earlier that came, that we think came from a long-necked dinosaur. It's right in front of you. Oh, and you're reminding I, me of the age. I want to make sure we get this in our time frame because this is the coolest thing. <laughs> and we just have a couple minutes left, mm -hmm. so I want to make sure we look at this. So this is a dinosaur egg. And it is actually the right size around. It, it didn't get bigger or smaller. So big, long-necked dinosaurs came out of eggs that look about the size of a softball. Wow. And some of the biggest dinosaur eggs are about basketball size. And we don't know what kind of long neck this was, but mm. how do we know it was a long neck? We know because this one is very, very round. Yeah. Theropods had slightly more oval okay. eggs. And one of the things, if you can make it to the museum when we open, is we have a new exhibit. It's a traveling exhibit called Tiny Titans. Mm -hmm. And in that exhibit, they talk about blue egg shells mm. on one of the nests they talk about because they were able to look at kind of the, the molecular level of this and find pigments that they know made the eggshell blue. Oh my God. And we haven't done that with this one. Wow. But that's amazing. Theoretically, we could find out. That's amazing. It is indeed. Well, I just love that. When we looked at it, when she first mm -hmm. took it out of the box, you, when you turn it over, you can actually see where the shell meets the, well, whatever was <laughs> inside of it. And there's even some parts of whatever baby animal was inside there. You can see the little pieces of bone or whatever that might be. So mm -hmm. it's kind of fun, like a big mystery of what might be in there. Yep. And we also, here in New Mexico, this one came from China. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm able to have it here again. It's part of our teaching collection. Yeah. But ah, I'm hoping that we'll be able to get that into let's, view a little bit. Let's move this up here a little bit and we will, whoops. Because it's really tiny. It's a little bitty eggshell. It's a little bitty eggshell. Let me get the glare down here a yeah. little bit. And here in New Mexico, a, a five-year-old. Yeah, it doesn't want to. Uh, yeah. We're having trouble with that. We saw it earlier. Yeah. And I'm not sure what happened. With but it looks like an eggshell. And a five-year-old walking with his parents saw what he saw, thought looked like an eggshell on the ground. And he picked it up. And they brought it to the museum. Yeah. And they, just, and they discovered the first eggshells here in New Mexico. So keep looking at the ground. There it and is. And who knows? Oh, now we got yep, it. Now we've now got it. Now we got it. Who knows what you might discover here in New Mexico, our next big find, perhaps. Yeah. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. And New Mexico, one of the reasons why these things are so, so prevalent here, why we find them so much, mm -hmm. is has, has it to do with our climate? Well, our climate, as a desert, we have rock. That's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. So you guys are going to watch a video after I'm done talking. Mm -hmm. And it's going to show you inside our museum. They're going to talk more about dinosaurs. They're going to bring up some of the words we talked about today. They're going to bring up some other words. And you're going to get to see behind the scenes in our collections where most people don't get to go. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we're going to stay tuned for this video. It's about 33 minutes, a little bit longer in length. But we want to thank you for joining us for At Home with APS. But mm -hmm. enjoy this video, and it will be uploaded to YouTube 
shortly so that you'll be able to watch it over and over again. Thanks for joining us in this step. Thanks for being here. You're welcome. Welcome to the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science. I'm Dr. Misty. I'm a museum educator here. And I'm Dr. Tom. I'm a curator of paleontology. And today we're going to be talking about dinosaurs! So a fossil is any evidence of past life. So I have some examples of different types of fossils here. Okay. So this is a piece of fossilized wood. See, it looks just like real wood, but it's actually rock. Oh, wow. The original organic materials have been replaced with different minerals. Wow, very cool. But it preserves all the original structure of the what's living thing. And it was a tree that was alive. That's right. Um, this is some sandstone, and it preserves the impression of the leaves, and there probably is also some carbonized uh, remnant of the original leaf material here, too. That's why it's discolored. Very cool. So you can see all the original veins. Right. So this would have been from a deciduous tree. Yep. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So these are, yeah, the leaves that dropped onto the ground. Um, so there's kind of an impression, as well as maybe a trace of the uh, material, okay. the original leaf. And then this is a chunk of dinosaur bone, uh, and this is very heavy. Wow. Um, and look, it's black. So the original bone would have looked like you know, kind of a white color. Oh, um, okay. And it has a lot of organic material originally. That's all gone, and it's been replaced by minerals that make this very heavy, and it's changed the color. Um, but it preserves detail microscopically of the original bone. Oh, wow. And do we know what animal this bone was originally part of? Yeah, this is probably from a Penaceratops. I think this is from one of the leg bones. Very awesome. And then the other type of fossil is a, a trace fossil, like a footprint, or some sort of an impression that the original plant or animal left behind. Oh, awesome. That is very cool. And so when the fossilization happens, we have minerals that are replacing the cavities where the organic material yep. once was. Yeah, so it's a mixture of replacement, the organic material, and you know, usually some sort of alteration of the original mineral or the original material. Awesome, very cool. So Dr. Tom, we're talking about fossils today. So this looks really cool and really awesome. Is this a fossil? No but oh. it's similar to fossils in some ways. So this was mud and sand, and uh, it was formed in flowing water. These ripples uh, indicate that the water was in motion, and it was moving the sediments, the mud and the sand, to these structures. Oh. And then it lithified, so it turned to rock later on, it was buried. Okay. And similar things happen to objects to become fossils. Okay, and this is not a fossil because it was not a bone first? Yeah, this is, yeah, there's no indication that there was anything living associated with this. It was just a rock that got frozen in exactly. this formation. So, Dr. Tom, how do we know a dinosaur from not a dinosaur? How, is there a way we can tell? Because what yeah. we're looking at right now looks like Some, a dinosaur. Sometimes indeed. people call these dinosaurs, uh, and it is an extinct animal. It's you know it's got big pointy teeth, like many dinosaurs do. It is a meat eater, but this is not a dinosaur. So the, okay, so this is not a dinosaur. So how could I tell for our viewers at home? How would we really uh, tell? One way you can tell is by looking at what we call their stance, like how they stand in their posture. Okay. 
Uh, and, and the thing about dinosaurs is, at least uh, for their hind legs, dinosaurs have what we say is an erect posture. Okay. They stand with their legs directly underneath their body. Oh, okay, so kind of like very yeah. straight. Yeah, where these guys, they look like they're doing push-ups. Oh, they um, do. But they're doing their push-ups with their hind legs and their front legs. Oh, okay, so on a dinosaur, they're nice and up underneath. At least their hind legs are. At least their hind legs, okay. And the first dinosaurs were like that. The so the first dinosaurs walked only on their hind legs. Oh, okay. And they walked with their legs directly below their bodies. Okay. Later, some dinosaurs become four-legged, and then they have sort of a push-up stance like this with their front legs, but they always have a fully erect posture with their hind legs. With their hind legs, okay. So if I see another fossil specimen in the museum, and it does not have the straight up and down hind legs, it is not a dinosaur. That's right. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, even if it's got those scary things. <laughs> <Even if it's laughs> awesome, thank you. Okay, so Dr. Tom, this is a different creature that we were looking at. Yes. And what we just learned, I'm gonna say this is a dinosaur? This is a dinosaur. Oh yeah, okay. In fact, this is the Mexico State fossil. Oh wow. This is a uh, Coelophysis. Okay. And um, how do we know it's a dinosaur? Well, uh, this would have looked very much like the very first dinosaurs. It stood on its hind legs, okay. and the hind legs are completely directly below its body. Right. It has this long tail seat for balance. Um, its forelimbs, they're held up like this so that it can grab prey, and they have these big claws. This is what the first dinosaurs would have looked like. Okay. Uh, and then they have many little sharp teeth with serrations. They're recurved and they're serrated. So probably the first dinosaurs were meat eaters. Okay. And so state fossil, this is awesome. I didn't know we had a state fossil. Yeah. So Coelophysis is our state fossil. So we just learned Coelophysis is a dinosaur. And what are we looking at here? So this is a block. It's a big chunk of rock that was taken from one of the most famous dinosaur quarries in the world, Ooh. which is here in New Mexico. Oh, wow. Um, it's from a locality we call Ghost Ranch. Oh my goodness. Which is in okay. northern New Mexico, and it's famous for the fossils of Coelophysis. Oh, so this is a whole block of Coelophysis yes. fossils? This is collected from what we call a bone bed. It's a place where hundreds of Coelophysis uh, died and were buried. Oh, wow. And how many Coelophysis do we have in this chunk here? Um, there's, gee, there's, there's several of them. I haven't counted them all, <laughs> but there's maybe a dozen. Wow. Uh, yeah, there's, there's several, at least partial skeletons of Coelophysis, and they range in size. So there's, this is probably a juvenile. That's a skull of one here. Here's another skull. Here's another skull. Wow. I mean, they're, they're all kind of intertwined. And, and mixed together, they were all buried together. They're all buried together, okay. And so maybe this, this might be a good time to ask, how, how are fossils formed? How do, how do we go from something that has passed away <laughs> to Well, uh, it's not completely understood, but almost certainly it's, the animals have to be buried very quickly after they die. Okay. So before the, they could decay, and uh, get now or chewed up by predators, right. scavengers or whatever. So they have to be buried quickly and in just the right kind of environment so that the bones fossilize. Okay. And when they fossilize, is there a specific process that's happening? So um, are we like filling the bone with something? Is it turning into something? Yeah, it's kind of a mix of things. So we know that some of the original bone minerals are still here. Maybe oh. they're changed a little bit. Uh -huh. So your bones have minerals in them. There's a, a mineral called hydroxyapatite. Uh, but then, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, all the organic material dissolves away, so it leaves oh, it wow. kind of spongy, and then probably new minerals form inside of that, the uh, spaces. Oh, okay, so is it kind of like the bones have turned to rock? Yes, yep. We say they've been mineralized, mineralized. or per-mineralized. Per -mineralized. Right? So okay. they're, yeah, they're very brittle, they're heavy, um, dense, uh, but they preserve microscopic details of the original bone. Awesome. Very cool. 
And I can see here there's some markings on the rock, not on the fossil. And so is this from excavation? Yeah, yeah. So some guy, somebody was here with tools. Um, I think they might have used a mixture of like dental tools, like little dental picks. And then they also probably used these little motorized scribes to chip away at the rock. So this is the rock that the bone is found in. And they chip the rock away to reveal the bone inside. Wow, that's really cool. And that's what you do, right, Dr. John? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the patience or the skill <laughs> to do this kind of very fine, careful work. I'd probably damage the specimen. So I let people that are better at that do that. But in the field, if you if you were out and you found a dinosaur? Uh, then I would collect it. So I would collect the whole block. So we collect the rock ah, that the dinosaur okay. bones are in. Okay. And then we do all the very careful, delicate preparation here in the lab. Here. Awesome. Very cool. So we're here in the Back to Bones Hall at the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science. And Dr. Tom, is this your dinosaur? Yeah, this is my favorite dinosaur. Uh, I collected this, or I was in charge of collecting it. And uh, then I was, uh, I took part in describing and naming this dinosaur. So. And what is its name? So the official name is Vistahi Verser Celia, which means it's a combination of Greek and Navajo, it means destroyer of the badlands. Oh, wow. Celia, uh, who's named after the person who actually discovered it, Paul Celia. So you discover a dinosaur, maybe you'll get one named after. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and okay, so that's kind of hard for you for me to say. So is there a nickname we can use? Yeah. So my favorite nickname for this is the Bistai Beast. Oh basically it says it all. That sounds awesome. It's very cool. And so I'm looking at this at a very large skull compared to my head, obviously. But look at those teeth. Uh-huh. So what kind of dinosaur was this? Would this have eaten me? Yes, definitely. Okay. This is a meat-eating dinosaur, okay. and uh, these animals, they replace their teeth continuously through life. Mm -hmm. So as the old teeth wear out, or they, they get broken, sometimes there's a tooth here that actually has a big chip out of it, probably from biting into the bone too hard. Okay. Uh, those teeth will fall out and then they'll be replaced, and the replaced kind of alternate. They kind of come in in waves, oh, yeah. alternating waves. So there's never a big gap. Right, okay. Uh, one of these guys, you can see it's serrated. They have these very fine, they call these denticles, these little teeth. So this can really slice in the meat. And you can see how narrow this is. It's actually still sharp. And there's one on the front. But these teeth are wider than you see in most meat eating dinosaurs. As so they can bite into bone really hard. That's so cool. And now it's got lots of holes in this is the skull part, correct? Yes. Where would its eyes have actually been? So uh, the eye, it's a little tricky, is this one is kind of a smaller one in the back. Oh. Not at the very back, but this right. one right here. So what was this? Was this its nose? Uh, no, its nose is way out in the very tip of its snout. Oh, okay. So here's so, the nose. So this they have these big holes in their skull. And uh, the skulls actually have air sacs in them, which is a little weird that apparently birds have those today. But uh, it probably made the skull lighter. Uh, we're not exactly sure why these had so many holes in their heads, uh -huh. but partly it was because they had this air sac system in their heads. Okay. Now, you also did something super cool with this fossil. You took it someplace in New Mexico, right? Yeah, so we took it up to Los Alamos National Labs. And we had this x-ray in a big uh, x-ray machine, and they spun it around as they x-rayed it, and it allows us to build up a three-dimensional model. So we can see uh, what this looks like inside the animal. That's awesome. So, like, inside where its brain was? Yeah. So its brain case is actually right back here in the middle, and they have pretty small brains compared to yourself. So their brain uh, is probably a little bigger than my fist. Not much bigger. And was did they have a big brain compared to other dinosaurs then? Yeah, this would have been a very smart dinosaur um, it, for the time in which it lived. Smarter than most other dinosaurs. And when did this live? 
So this is from the late Cretaceous. This is about 75 million years old. Yeah, so this is a relative of Tyrannosaurus rex. It's, a, it's smaller than T-Rex. It had lived about 10 million years before. before. So you can kind of think of this as a cousin. Okay, so it's related to T-Rex. It is mostly related to T-Rex. Oh, very awesome. And then what, in its time period, would it have preyed on? Anything it wanted to. <laughs> uh, so this is a, probably a variety of different dinosaurs. Um, there were duckbill dinosaurs, horn dinosaurs, um, pachycephalosaurs, and chylosaurs, you know, they probably hunted everything. Everything. So that, is there a word for that? When you're a hunter at the top, is there a word for that? He is at the top of the food chain. So he's an apex predator? Yes. Awesome. Very, very cool. That's awesome. Uh, though these dinosaurs would have been a tyrannosaur, it seems like, yeah, they were the king of the world. Uh, they did not have an easy life. They probably didn't live very long. Uh, they probably didn't live more than about 30 years. Oh, wow. And usually when you look at various specimens, they almost all have nasty wounds that uh, they're not always completely healed. Uh, so they, they ran into a lot of problems. And would they have, would this have been because of them hunting or would this be because they were running into other predators? Yeah, we don't really know. They probably were fighting each other a lot. Um, like territorial? Maybe, maybe, you know, we're speculating, but yeah. yeah. And, uh, they probably got injured by prey sometimes too. They were the prey to fight back. Right. And, uh, <laughs> I would yeah. fight back. <laughs> so, like, this particular specimen has a rib that was broken, oh. that was healed. Okay. So, and it also has lots of injuries. Um, there's a big hole on one side of its jaw. Maybe it was bit by another mistakes, we don't know. Oh, interesting. And I'm noticing down here on this end, its uh, nasal cavity is actually quite large. Would they have been good smellers? Would they have been able to smell really well? This dinosaur, we don't know so much from the size of the aerial cavity, uh -huh. uh, but we do know from the brain. So it has these big olfactory lobes, these big extensions of the brain that uh, specialize in smell, in sense of smell. They're a particularly large in tyrannosaur dinosaurs. So we think that it's a very keen sense of smell. I think it smelled really well. And then I think I have one last question here. Which way did their eyes point? Uh, this one, these guys have kind of wide heads uh -huh. compared to other meat dinosaurs. And it probably actually gave the eyes sort of a forward look. So they could look forward. And uh, they probably had a little bit of stereoscopic vision. So would that help them hunt better? Yeah, we think so. It probably helps them judge how far away uh, prey is. Ah, uh, the distance and, between them. Uh, and at least when they're young, they can run very fast, so maybe it helped them sort of run. They lived in this sort of a jungly environment. Ah, uh, so. okay. So they had good smell, good eyesight? Good eyesight. So they were super hunters. Super hunters, and they're very, we say, agile. They're able to, to move around and, and kind of shift their way through the jungle very quickly. That is awesome. Very cool. So, Dr. Tom, what do we have here? We're still in Back to Bones. Yes. But it's a different bone. This is another Cretaceous dinosaur, so this lived alongside the Vistites. This is probably one of the animals that the Vistites ate. This is a Pentaceratops, which means five horn face. So, they have. Um, a big horn over each eye, this one's missing the whole the brow horns. Okay. Uh, horn over the nose, you see there's a small one there, and then it's got a cheek one on each side, so it's all five. So there'd be one on the other side as well. Yes. Yeah, this is the yeah. Very cool. Now, one of the first things that strikes me about this is not only that it's um, very wide compared to the Vista Beast, but the map is very different. Yeah, so what do you think? Is this a meat eater or a plant eater? So, let's see, if I look closely, his teeth don't look very sharp. And look at the front of the mouth. I don't doesn't see. have any teeth at all. Yeah, there. It has a beak. Actually, it has a beak in the front of its mouth, like a bird. So, I'm going to guess it's a beak or one. Yes. Awesome. You're correct. <laughs> so, uh, it has a beak in the front, okay. for cropping the vegetation, and then it actually chews its food. So, oh, this okay. like beak doesn't chew, it swallows everything whole. Okay. This actually chews its food. Oh. Most dinosaurs don't chew. Horn dinosaurs do. The horn dinosaurs do. Okay. And um, 
so that word is herbivore, correct? Yes. For a leaf eater. Awesome. Very cool. And so could you point out, so I'm at the nose end. <laughs> so where yeah, you know? so they have a, a, a big uh, mirror area. It's got a big hole in the front. That's only part of it. In life, that nostril wouldn't have been that big. So okay. that would have been covered with soft tissue, okay. um, with skin. Um, probably the nostril is a lot smaller than this big hole, but we don't really know what filled that space. It's right. Space. Okay. The eye then is right here will be below the horn. Oh, all the way up there. Yeah. Oh, wow. And uh, and then we're the other part we're missing is the frill. So these oh. have a big frill that's stuck over. The frill would have been very much. Pentaceratops skulls are gigantic. Uh, they probably would have been about seven or eight feet long. Wow. Just the skull. Just the skull. Wow, that is very large. And so this part that's arcing up this way, that's going into the frill then? Yes. Okay. It's the only part that's preserved. Okay. Very cool. And so the Vistibase would have eaten <laughs> Pentaceratops. Yes. Yep. Poor Pentaceratops. <laughs> 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 this is a lower jaw on Pentaceratops. It doesn't actually go with this animal. Um, it was found with a different specimen. But, you know, it was about the same. This would have had another bone out here to help a beak. Uh, okay. A, a bottom beak, too. A bottom beak. And then there's a gap where there wasn't any teeth. And then the teeth would have been lining all along here. Most of these have fallen out. But back here, there are still a few teeth in place. And they don't chew on the top, they actually chew on the sides, which is really strange. And so for the beak, were they like grabbing with the beak and pulling and then chewing back here? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's very Yeah. Cool. It's a very strange one. And where would it, uh, uh, so Pentaceratops, just like the Vista Beast, is solely in New Mexico, correct? Yes, Pentaceratops is known only from New Mexico, so we have a lot of our own unique dinosaurs. And is there a specific spot where in New Mexico where we find a lot of Pentaceratops, or are they found all over the state? Uh, almost all of these are from what we call the San Juan Basin, which is up in northwestern New Mexico near Farmington. Oh, wow, okay, our friends in Farmington have yes. a lot of dinosaurs a long time ago. <laughs> uh, especially from the Vistai area. This by that. So, okay, so Dr. Tom, we're still here in the back of the bones hall, but what are we looking at now? Because this does not look like a dinosaur to me. This is the head of a dinosaur called Parasaurolophus. Parasaurolophus? <laughs> <laughs> Some people call it Parasaurolophus. Either way is right. Parasaurolophus. Might be, yeah, easy okay, to say that. Okay, easy to say that. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, it's a strange looking dinosaur, there's no doubt about it. Definitely. Uh, it's not complete, so some of it's missing, including it would have had a big flat beak. Okay. Because this is a duck billed dinosaur. Oh, okay. Uh, but the weird thing about this one is that it has this crest that sticks out on the top of its head, and curves back, and that's almost four feet long. Wow, that is really long. And so, okay, so this isn't anything like the Vista Beast or the Pentaceratops, yeah. as far as it looks. So, did this crest have a, a purpose? Like, um, yeah, it's it's not solid. It's actually hollow, and it had like tubing inside of it. That when this animal breathed, it drew air through the crest through this tubing. Oh wow! So it drew air through it. Hmm. And we think it acted as a resonating chamber. Ooh. So it actually amplified certain sounds. Certain sounds, okay. So if it did amplify certain sounds, then it actually hooted? Yeah, it was actually having, uh, it essentially had a built-in musical instrument on top of his head. Oh, wow. In fact, the nickname for this dinosaur is the trombone dinosaur. Oh, that is super cool. That's awesome. Um, and you did something special with this dinosaur too, correct? So we x-rayed the skull of this and saw what the tubing looked like, and we used that to build a computer model to figure out what kinds of sounds it could have amplified. Oh, wow. Okay. And so maybe if we listen really hard, if you guys put your listening ears on, we can hear what that sound sounded like. Did you hear it? What we think Parasolophus sounded like, correct? Yeah, it made these very low sounds. But those are the types of sounds that would travel for long distances 
through the thick jungles that this animal lived in. Oh, wow. And so do we know why it would have made sounds? Do we have an idea? Uh, well, we, we can look at living animals that make sounds and uh, see what they use sounds for. And they probably were using these sounds to communicate with each other. Oh, okay. Maybe like, oh, there's a predator nearby, or hey, I'm over here? Yeah, maybe, <laughs> like, maybe it's to learn territory, like, don't come over here, this is my spot. Ah, okay, this is okay, don't come over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome, very cool. And so, um, this type of dinosaur would have eaten leaves? Yeah. Okay. This is a plant eater, so this is one of the only other groups of dinosaurs that could chew their food. So most, most dinosaurs couldn't chew, really. Uh, the duck-billed dinosaurs, the horned dinosaurs, are the only kinds that developed uh, a way of chewing food. Oh, wow. Very cool. And so they were herbivores. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. These are plant eaters. Very cool. Plant eaters. That is an amazing crest. So my last question, I think, for, about this dinosaur is, if your crest is that big, how big was the rest of it? Uh, so this belonged to an animal that was about the same size as an elephant. Elephant, wow. Yeah, but built completely differently. So they would stand on just their hind legs, or maybe sometimes would walk on all fours. Okay. Then they had that long tail to balance. Okay. Um, and they're kind of narrow and tall. Narrow and tall, okay. And those hind legs, again, it's a dinosaur, so it was... Uh, yeah, fully erect gait. Awesome, very cool, like our sealer places. This is very cool. Uh, welcome everyone. We're here in collections with Dr. Tom. Dr. Tom, what are we looking at? This is so massive. Isn't this amazing? This is part of a dinosaur skeleton. So no. these are the backbones or some of them for our giant sauropod dinosaur, Seismosaurus. Oh my Which goodness. is from New Mexico. So which part is the fossilized bone and which part is the rock? This is hard um, to tell. Sometimes it's hard to tell because the the rock that it's in, it's very hard, and it's similar in color to the actual bone. So wow. it makes it a little more challenging to prepare. It has a different texture, and you can see that as you're preparing it out. Oh. The bone is smooth, Okay. and uh, the rock is sand, it's sandstone. So you can kind of see how, see how the sandstone is rough. Oh yeah, and then this is smooth here. Um, but the bone is very delicate, so they have to chip away to remove the rock from the bone. And in some places, this bone is incredibly thin. It's paper thin. Oh, wow. So very fragile. And so which part of the dinosaur, of the seismosaurus, was this compared to our bodies? Well, this is lying on its side. Okay. So these are bones of the back. So if you look at these um, here, these are called the neural spines. And these correspond to the bumps. If you feel along your back, oh, I think those that. are the bumps on your backbone that um, jut out along your back. Can you guys feel along your backbone? Can you feel bumps? Yeah, that's where this was for the dinosaur. And these side uh, little projections here, this is where the ribs attached. So these giant ribs. So this is um, kind of its chest would be here, its chest cavity. Oh, wow. And so our ribs are here. Mm -hmm. And so these would have been coming like around. Like I said, it's, it's lying on its side. So that's pointing along the back, mm -hmm. and then the ribs would be coming out like this. So awesome. This, the side of the rib cage. That is massive. It is huge. <laughs>
this is amazing. The real fossil. This is a lower jaw oh, of a wow. deck-built dinosaur. This is Parasaurolophus. These are the teeth. Oh, that's awesome. So they grow, and this is actually where they chew on this side right here. Oh, wow. So this is real bone. It's heavy. If you want to see how heavy it is. Very cool. Oh my gosh, <laughs> it's really heavy. Yeah, because it's fossilized. So we make a copy. Sometimes it's easier to study the copy or it's easier to display it. So this is an exact replica. So we build a mold around this. Then we take the mold off and then we fill it with, this is an epoxy resin. So we fill it in as a liquid and it hardens. Ah. And so it, it looks exactly like the original fossil. Oh, wow. Except it's very light. Oh, and it's very that's strong. That's awesome, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to, it's not so fragile. Um, and for a paleontologist, sometimes that's all they need. You just need to look at the, be able to see what the shape of the fossil and is. And it's just easier to pick up and turn around. Exactly. And stuff. Very cool. Well, thank you, Dr. Mom, for taking us on this wonderful journey about the Mexico dinosaurs. We hope you learned a whole bunch today, and thank you for, for coming along on our journey with us. Yeah, I hope you come again. Bye. Bye. Boys and girls and to our grown-ups that are out there, this is Ms. Jacobson here at home with APS. This is our final filming and our final broadcast for this summer. And we hope that you have enjoyed all of the shows that we have put together for you over these last four weeks, as well as those that aired in the spring from mid-March, April through May and into June. All of those videos are archived on the APS Expect Great Things YouTube channel, along with some additional pieces that you might really enjoy. Today, we visited with our special guest, Deborah Novak from the Museum of Natural History here in Albuquerque. And she has really inspired me to continue to learn through this summer as we get ready for our school year. I wanna thank you and I wanna thank all of the folks around the country who have been watching our shows but I especially want to thank the team of people who put these shows together here at APS, our videographers, our folks within the curriculum and instruction department, and our leadership team who made all of this possible. Thank you for all that you've done. Stay well until we can all be together again. We want to make sure that we send you all our best here at home with APS. Thanks for joining us.